Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer J. Raffler, and I'm here today with Wayne Curden. And Wayne has some experiences with UFOs back in 1967, and um, I'd like to let him share that with you. It's quite interesting to say the least. So um, Wayne, could you please tell us about the June 5th, 1967 event that you experienced? Sure. Jennifer. Well, uh, by way of introduction to this story, I had always been interested in science fiction novels and movies, especially those that portrayed aliens coming to Earth, such as Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood Zen and H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And I knew that science fiction usually eventually becomes science fact. So I, I was naturally drawn to organizations devoted to recording and investigating UFO sightings. Okay. I joined two of the organizations, uh, NICAP, which is National Investigating Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and APRO, okay. the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And I became uh, an investigator for both of them. So Me? what I would do back in the 60s, I would uh, read the local newspapers for my Connecticut, where I lived, and any reports of uh, UFO sightings, I would go and find the, uh, the witnesses and interview them and record the interview. Okay. This was back in the 60s, so all we had was reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Gotcha. Another thing I would do back then was join other investigators at night in observing the skies over what we called UFO hotspots, areas for some reason that had a lot of UFO sightings. This was in Connecticut, correct? Right, uh, southeastern Connecticut. But okay. I traveled all over the, the state. Now, from my research, I knew that UFOs had been associated with power outages, such as the 1965 New York City blackout. Mm. And I had read that uh, Paul Santorini, a physicist and engineer who was a pioneer in the development of radar and who was a respected fellow of the New York Academy of Sciences, had speculated publicly that the 1965 New York City blackout and other power failures could have been caused by UFOs. Mm. So uh, on the morning of June 5th, 1967, I heard on the news that a large area of Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland had experienced a blackout. So I figured that night would be a good time to do some observing of the night sky. Yeah. And I didn't have to go far from my home because there was a power station directly across from my house, about one mile on the other side of a cove in Uncasville, Connecticut. Okay. In the, I'm going to read uh, a nightcap report of the UFO sighting from that night. So 9.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, June 5th, 1967. A man saw three lights in triangular formation that hovered over, over a power station, emitting a brilliant blue flash and moved away. Two of the lights were red and pulsating, and the third was a steady white. They were viewed through binoculars. So that was the report that NICAP received, and it was sent by me. That man was me. But what I didn't report to NICAP was that the steady white light moved from the power plant directly toward me, toward my house. And as I looked at it through my binoculars, I could see that it was a circular disc with a row of lights around the circumference. Sure. And the lights changed from white to a, like an amber color. And I was standing outside my house in the driveway as it silently approached. And you can imagine seeing something that huge without making a sound. It was very eerie. 
Mm. And, and I estimated that it was larger than my house, probably a hundred feet in diameter. Wow. And amazingly, I felt no fear, but only what I could describe as awe or reverence. Wow. It felt like a spiritual experience. And I, I think it's because I knew that whoever was piloting the craft had to have a higher consciousness. So I tried to communicate telepathically. And uh, I asked through my thoughts, I would love to meet you. How can I get to meet you? And immediately I received the thought saying, you will find a teacher. Mm. So I thought that was, that was my first experience of a UFO sighting. It, was, it went directly over my house and then it continued till it disappeared behind a, a hill. Wow. And later I found that on that same evening, June 5th, 1967, near Shamokin, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. there was a similar UFO sighting with three objects in a triangular formation, one of which was near power transmission lines. And this sighting lasted for 90 minutes and was seen by a school principal, teachers, and many elementary school students. So I thought that was a, a confirmation that I wasn't just seeing but people <laughs> in the next state. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, so so and it, was, and it was connected with the, uh, it was in the same area as, as the power failure earlier in that day. And yeah. one, of, one of the objects was directly over the power transmission line. And the next morning I was reading the newspaper as usual for sightings and I read that Putnam, Connecticut, and other areas of Connecticut had experienced uh, minor power failures that night. Wasn't it uh, as major as what Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey had experienced? But there, there were power failures in Connecticut. So that was my June 6, 1967 UFO sighting. And I had another one three months later. Did you have any questions about the green one, or do you want me to just go into the, the, the second one? Yeah, I do have some questions um, and comments. It was just amazing that you saw the UFO initially, it was over the power plant, correct? Correct. And then it came towards you, correct? Yeah, it was almost as if uh, my consciousness, my awareness of it, drew it toward me. That's what I'm thinking. Totally. Yeah. And um, did you ever find a teacher? When you got the response, you will find a teacher. Do you think you found that teacher yet? Yes, uh, I have. Okay. Are you willing to share who that teacher is? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not not quite yet. Not quite they're, yet. They're not ready. They're not ready to go public yet. Gotcha. But they will soon. Okay. Maybe in a future interview, you, I can tell you more about it. Okay. Yeah, we could move on to your September second, nineteen sixty-seven, Waterford and Hartford, Connecticut experience. So about three months later, I had a second sighting, which wasn't as close, but which was also seen by others in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So it was around between, I'd say, 10.30 and 11 on the night of September 2nd. And I was on the coast of Connecticut near Waterbury, looking south, southeast toward the ocean. And I was expecting a UFO sighting because a Brazilian UFO researcher, Dr. Olavo Fontes, had predicted in March of 1967 that there would be a, a large wave of UFO sightings beginning in September of 1967. Now, don't ask me how he knew that. He, he based his prediction on his theory of UFOs, where they come from, when they come. I had a pair of high-powered binoculars, and I noticed a bright light approaching from the ocean. And at first, I thought it might be a jet, 
but as it came closer, I didn't hear any noise. So that ruled out any man-made flying object. Also, when I looked at it through my binoculars, I could see that it was a wingless silver cigar shaped object with a bright li white light in the front, a bluish green light in the center, and a red tail light. And the object silently crossed the sky in a matter of two or three minutes, heading in a straight line north northwest. And I have no idea how high or how large it was, but it was about the size of a short, thick pen at arm's length, to give you an idea. It was, I imagine it was pretty huge. That same night, around midnight, a cigar-shaped UFO flashing red, green, and white lights was seen near Polk Park in West Hartford by Jane Jondro. She said that the object was visible for about 10 minutes, flying about 1,000 feet high, and it made a sound like a window fan. So apparently it was a lot lower when she saw it, and she could hear a, a slight noise like a window fan. And there were two other sightings at 11.05 and 11.20 near Avon, Connecticut. And I'm going to read the, the newspaper report on those sightings. Okay. So James Hill, driving near Talcott Mountain, reported seeing a robot-like creature standing beside the road. The being was clothed in a one-piece silvery garment that covered hands and feet and moved its arms slowly and stiffly as though trying to stop cars. An, I, an unidentified waiter driving in the opposite direction also saw the figure around the same time. An opaque helmet covered the being's head. Investigating police officers found no sign of the being. Mm. That was a newspaper report. And when I read that the following morning, or I guess it was the day after, Mm -hmm. I I found where Pole Park was, and I and I looked on a map where I was in Waterford. And if you draw a straight line between the Water, Waterford and Pole Park and extend that line, it would cross right over Talcott Mountain. So those my sighting and the two other sightings were in the same. Line and the next day I drove to Hartford and I, while I was driving around I was listening to talk to a talk radio show mm -hmm. and the, the sightings of the night before were big news because a lot of people in Hartford saw something and one of the callers called in and said that he saw a cigar a cigar shaped UFO divide in half and the red half landed on Talcott Mountain. Wow. So that was the confirmation of my sightings. So with both of these UFO experiences, I know with the first one, you felt that it was somewhat of a spiritual experience. So that would remove U.S. military, correct, out of the equation? Yeah, I don't think it was any uh, man-made uh, military craft. Okay. I don't think we have anything that large that would fly without a sound. Would you consider these people ETs? Either ETs or ITs. Either way, they're probably the higher consciousness. So I think either ETs, extraterrestrial, or ITs, interterrestrial. And they could also be interdimensional from a higher dimension because if a being is in a physical dimension like we are, I don't think it would be possible to live below the surface where there's high temperatures and uh, pressures. So you'd have to be a, more of a spiritual being. Okay. To live the earth. So are you thinking that this um, craft is from Agartha? Yeah, my 
my favorite theory of where UFOs come from is Agartha. And then for the second UFO, the cigar-shaped one, um, do you think that was IT's? Because it was associated with a, a being in a like a space suit. Yeah. That the uh, extra extraterrestrial who may may not have been uh, also uh, in another dimension. May not have been another dimensional being. Because if they required a suit, then okay. they they probably breathe a different. Uh, gas or needed protection from Earth's radiation or something. I'm not sure why they would have been in the suit. Is there potential it could have been a human? If it was a human, I don't see any reason why they would have wore a, a suit with a helmet. Like a it was a, a human pilot. They don't see any reason for wearing a, a helmet and suit. I was reading this while you were talking. I pictured the old spacesuits that the Americans when they supposedly so, went to the moon. That's what I uh -huh. saw. And I was thinking maybe he was ejected from a craft or something, some kind of, I don't know, accident happened. There he was in his spacesuit with the intention of him going somewhere else, but he didn't make it. Well, that's how I was thinking possibly it could have been a human. Um, but now I'm thinking from what you're saying, it could be somebody from another planet that requires different gases in order to be on our, our planet. Yeah, I don't think our military has any cigar-shaped craft, wingless cigar-shaped craft. Don't make any noise. Okay. Okay. Well, Wayne, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to the two UFO encounter? Just that it was a, a phase I was going through. I was interested in UFOs at the time, and mm -hmm. I I still have an interest in UFOs, but I'm not as uh, intimately involved today. The I know that there continue to be UFO sightings all over the world. Millions of people have seen UFOs. And I'm hoping that sometime, hopefully in the near future, the, the, there will be disclosure of what exactly these craft and, and beings are. And I'm hoping that I think it will happen when humanity's consciousness is raised to a, a level where they won't freak out when, when the truth is revealed mm. and that uh, mankind will be more accepting of okay. who these beings are. Thank you so much, Wayne, for contributing to the What's Up Facebook page, and I'm looking forward to sharing our interview. And as always, if anything comes up that you would like to share with us, just let me know and we can get an interview going and get the information out there. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. You have a most awesome day and enjoy the sun in the city of the sun. And I will talk to you soon, Wayne. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.